You might be seated. In reading this particular word, you can hear the pathos and the cry of Nehemiah as he cries out to God on behalf of his people. They were in great affliction. They were in great reproach. The walls had been broken down and the gates had been burned. It was a time of crises for Nehemiah and his people. And Nehemiah found that through getting the attention of God and through humbling himself, he could help his people through this medium. And so Nehemiah fell upon his face and fasted and prayed. There have been other times of crises in church people's lives. There have been other great men of God who have come to a point in their ministry of a crisis. They have turned also and found that through fasting and prayer they get all of their needs met. These are days that I believe that many of our problems can only be met through fasting and prayer. Would you say amen? Jeremiah in his writings, the man that was known as the weeping prophet, spoke of his day. He said, far from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Think about it, even the priest and the prophet were dealing falsely in the days of Jeremiah. He went on to say, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know, the number one cry of the world today is peace. But we're finding there is no peace. Take a globe and spin it, and wherever it would stop and place your finger upon that location, there is either a war going there, or there's a tender box waiting to be ignited. It's trouble on every hand, and men are crying peace. But there is no peace in this world of ours today. I am convinced the only time that there'll ever be world peace is when we find peace with our Heavenly Father, God Almighty. Would you say amen? Verse 16, he said this, Thus saith the Lord. Over and over again, it's not what men would say in this hour. It is again, we're going to have to wait and hear what thus saith the Lord. It is not the opinions of men. It is not this and that and the other. What we're needing today is to hear from God Almighty. We need to hear the thundering force of a voice that is sure and clear in this day of uncertainty. When so many voices are saying so many different and various things, we need to hear what thus saith the Lord. And Jeremiah said this, thus saith the Lord. Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Somebody raise your hand and say amen. But on down after Jeremiah's day, some 2,000 years ago, again the world stood in a time of world crises. It was a time when religion had become a hollow mockery. It was a time when Rome was ruling the world. They say that Rome even bragged that the enemy would never see the heels of a Roman soldier. There were men dying for different and various causes. But in the midst of that kind of a crisis, when it seemed that religion had lost all of its effect, when it seemed it was nothing but a hollow mockery, there was a group of 120 that met in an upper room and fasted and prayed and sought the face of God and they did hear from heaven. And I would say to you in this hour, in a time of uncertainty, if we as a church would join together and fast and pray, I believe that we can hear from heaven. Would you raise your hands and say amen? You know, there was a day the church sought for power from on high, but we're reaching the day it seemed that we're preaching and seeking for popularity upon earth. But we're not needing the applaudance of men in this hour. We're not needing the popularity of the world necessarily, but we are needing the power of an almighty God that we might see signs and wonders in our midst, that we might see once again the breath of God breathed upon a church that needs to hear from heaven. I tell you in this hour, that day and the hour when those men fasted and prayed 
place the Bible said suddenly there came a sound as of a rushing mighty wind we need to hear that sound again in August 1978 we need to hear the wind of God blowing through the church of God would you raise your hand and say amen there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire and it sat upon the heads of each of them and they began to speak speak a language the world had never heard before they began to speak a language the devil could not interfere with they began to tap in a solid line between them and God and I believe this friend when they staggered down those stairs in that day I believe beating in their heart was the assurance that what God had given unto them would help them to meet any crises they might encounter and in this hour of 19 78 the same Holy Ghost power will give us the ability to cope with any situation that may come our way raise your hand again and say amen in August 1978 I think as Nehemiah's day was and as Jeremiah's day was and the day of the 120 we're facing a time of great crises we're finding a time when there is absolutely no hope outside of this book that I read to you from. There is no other source that we can look to for the strength and the guidance that we're needing in this hour. I know the strength that we have in America. We have some 41 Polaris submarines. We've got planes and satellites in the air all hours of the day. We've got scientists working in dark laboratories perfecting the weapons of war. But I say unto you in this hour, in spite of all of our defenses, America is trembling this morning. We're trembling not because of our lack of military might. Our fear is not because we're worried about invasion from Russia or China. China, but there is a far more sinister force that's invaded this United States of America. It's the powers of sin, the powers of sin that threaten to sweep this republic off of its foundation. It's the powers of sin that seek to invade even the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I would say to you in this hour again, he purchased this church with his blood and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Would you say amen? You know, over and over again, we're seeing men. I watched with interest some few months ago a telecast as a man who one time preached to thousands of people. He was known as perhaps the next Billy Graham. He wrote a book that became quite popular. And I watched that morning with extreme interest as he was interviewed there on the television screen. And he was explaining to the commentator how he lost his faith in God. You know, that's a very difficult thing to understand. It's hard to comprehend men taking their lives as they're doing on every hand. But I believe this, suicide is simply not a way out for the world, but it's a way of escape from the problems they don't know how to deal with. And I'm saying to you in this moment of time that unless we fast and pray and seek the face of God, we will face the same circumstances. It's not just outside the church world. The church world is feeling the grip of the uncertainty of our hour. It's feeling the feeling that I don't know how to cope with it. But I would say to you again, Jesus Christ came to give life and that life more abundantly and greater is he that's within us than he that is within this world somebody raise your hand and praise his name loneliness can sometimes be the greatest problem facing this world I read some time ago in the largest newspaper in Birmingham Alabama the Birmingham News there on the front page of the newspaper it carried the headlines it was not famine it was not some economic problem but it had in big black bold letters simply loneliness the world's greatest problem and it's happening in this day how can we be lonely in a world that's so filled with people but even in the church world in the midst of a busy hectic people crowded church you can find yourself feeling so alone you can find yourself feeling that no Nobody really cares. Nobody really understands in that moment of time again. There is no one that can really help you. But when you drop upon your knees and turn your face toward heaven,
heaven, I'll tell you this, there will come an illuminating light from glory that will wipe the cobwebs out of your soul and put a joy that is unspeakable. Some time ago I went to my dad's who has a farm and I asked my dad, could I take my daughter and teach her how to plow? I want my girls to know how to work. I don't want everything to be handed to them upon a silver platter. And I, I took Sheila out in the middle of this huge field and I put her on the tractor. And I said, I want you to plow to the other end after I'd showed her how to operate the tractor. And there in the middle of that huge field as Sheila was making the rounds of that field disking in, I stood there and I felt this thing called loneliness. I felt all the pressures that can somehow crowd in upon a man's life. And there in the middle of that field was no one anywhere around Sheila at the far end of the row. I stood there and an overwhelming sense of loneliness gripped my soul. And I bowed my head and tears trickled down my cheek. But as surely as I'm standing behind this sacred desk this morning, all of a sudden the glories of God sprung forth in my heart and my life. And I felt the wonderful comforting arms of God encircle my life. And I'll tell you this in this hour friend in a moment of loneliness in a moment of crises if you turn your faith toward God he will speak unto your heart's words you need to hear he will give unto you everything you need somebody raise your hand in praise and magnify his holy name oh hallelujah I would tell you in this hour fasting and prayer will save your ministry let me say it again fasting and prayer will save your ministry we can become so caught up with all the events that's transpiring around us until we can find ourselves while preaching to others becoming castaways we can be so carried away with the legitimate things of religion until somehow the sob would seep out of our souls and the burden that one time drove us to our knees will leave us. It's not these things that are so much wrong that's bothering the ministry today. It's the legitimate things that's creeping in upon our time. It's those things that somehow we have to grapple with every day. And I'm reminded over and over again, Judas somehow lost out with God and nobody around him seemingly even knew about it you may have a form and you may have a sound but oh only you and God really know where you are this morning Matthew's gospel recorded in chapter 7 verse 22 many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. John Wesley once said, what a dreadful thing it would be for me if I should be ignorant of the power of truth while I am preparing to proclaim. Richard Baxter said, God never saved any man for being a preacher. I would say to you through fasting and prayer this morning you'll find that you can't go it alone. You'll find there's no way that you can do this work for God all by yourself. It's still not by might nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. Raise your hand and praise His name this morning. I find no record anywhere of this man, the Apostle Paul, asking for help during his time. Though he was shipwrecked, though he was imprisoned, though his back was beaten, though he had many hardships along the way, he never wrote a letter asking for help. But here and now is he's in a jail cell beneath a jail cell. And he writes a letter, and in this letter we hear the first hint that he's needing some comfort and needing some help. You know what happened to him? He simply pins the words, it's very painful. And he said, Demas, 
has forsaken me having loved this present world. Now I don't know how Demas got away from Paul. It boggles my mind. I don't know how in the world a man could be associated with such a man as the Apostle Paul and lose his faith in God. I don't know how he left. But I do know this, he didn't leave like a man. No man walks out on God like a man. If you leave God, you have to crawl away from God. He's erected too many barricades. It's not the will of God that any man should perish. And if you go to hell, you'll have to fight yourself there every step of the way. No man should go to hell. Hell was not created for you. And it's not the will of God that any man should perish. And listen to me this morning. Morning, every gospel sermon, every gospel song, every church that raises fire toward heaven is a barricade to keep the world out of pits of hell. Somebody raise your hand and say amen. Oh God. This present world is the greatest enemy that we're facing in the hour that we're living in. This present world. You know, the devil knows exactly how to dress up his bill of goods. He knows how to polish it. This merchandise, Mark, doesn't know anything about advertising compared to the devil. He knows how to make it look so inviting. He can make the light so alluring. He can make the music so enticing. But I'll tell you this, friend, sometime you'll get to the bitter dredges, and it's not everything the devil revealed to you to be. I don't know how demons left. And I don't know if he made it, but let's say that he did. I would know this this morning. He never could forget how it felt to stand and feel the anointing of God upon his ministry. He woke up, no doubt, during the wee hours of the night in a cold sweat, remembering the man, the Apostle Paul, as he laid hands upon the sick and they had to recover under the anointing of God. Old Demas had to remember the times when Paul would walk up to a man that was possessed by demons and he would say in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus and demons had to flee I want to tell you this friend that same name that had power in that day it's got power in 1978 somebody raise your hand and praise him Raise your hand again and praise him and worship him. Fasting and prayer will not only save a man's ministry, but I believe that fasting and prayer will save our families. You know, strange that we can't come to grips with this situation. Even our leaders are telling us one of the greatest problems facing us is the problems of the breakup of the home. The focus is being shifted away from the home and even now the authorities in the secular world are realizing we must come to grips with this issue. When we're approaching one out of every two marriages breaking up, something needs to be done. And the frightening thing is this, though it's sweeping and somehow eating away and eroding the foundations of our America. It's invading the church of the Most High God. And we don't know exactly how to deal with it. We don't know exactly how to cope with it. But I'll tell you this, friend, I know we don't have time to deal with all the questions that would be raised. But I still believe if you raise them in the way they should go, when they get old, they will not depart from it. God said of Abraham, I know Abraham, that he will command his children after him. Would you say amen? In Judges chapter 5, it's perhaps the saddest verse of scripture that you'll read anywhere in the whole Bible. It tells a story of a mother, a mother that's sitting beside the window and weeping through a lattice for a son that would not be coming home. It tells a story of Sisera, her son. Sisera simply was a man that took what he wanted for 20 
50 long years he raped and plundered and mutilated Israel but finally God said it's enough and the Bible said even the stars in the heaven fought against him and now then this time has come by and Sisera lay dead with a nail through his temple and now then his mother sits by this window and somehow her mother's premonition tells her that her son would not be coming home I don't know the Bible doesn't really say but it seems to indicate that Sisera's mother ever always let him do pretty well what he wanted to do it seemed like that he could always get by I would say to you parents this morning don't ever condone wrongdoing don't ever make your child comfortable in sin if they're going to sin make it just as uncomfortable as it can be let them know that your house is a house of God and as for you and your family you're going to serve God Almighty Raise your hands and praise and magnify His name. Picture this mother sitting beside this window and weeping through the lattice for her son that would not be coming home. And there's a lot of people across this land of ours and they're sitting in the very same situation because of the life they've lived they've lost their children if there's ever been a time that we need to live it if there's ever been a time it's not just in the church you may fool the church for a while but mama and daddy i would say to you this morning your son and your daughter know you for exactly what you are the preacher may not know and the church may not know but when you close that door on your home your sons and your daughters know you exactly for what you are hey, Mr. Dad, let me ask you a question this morning. How long has it been since you fasted and prayed and got up on a Sunday morning service and as you testified, tears flowed down your cheek as you felt the wonderful presence of God. And I would ask you, Mom, this morning, how long has it been since your children stumbled over your legs in the middle of the night as you prayed for God to make you a better mother? We need somehow to understand we'll only save our families when we fast and seek and know the will of God and His face. Would you say amen? I'll never forget that General Assembly some number of years ago. And Brother Cecil Knight stood and made a statement. I've never forgot it. It shattered my heart as I sat there in that meeting. I have never had a statement in all of my life before nor since to so sober me. But he asked the question. He said, what have you gained? If you gain the whole world and lose your own sons and daughters. And I would repeat that question this morning. If we win the whole world and lose our own sons and daughters, what have we gained? My God, we've got to have a revival in the family. We've got to fast and pray for the family. We've got to have a move in the church family. Oh God, we talk about doubling in a decade. Here is the answer right here. If somehow we can win those families that are already in the church, you talking about doubling, here is the answer. But you can't do it without fasting. Would you say amen? I would say to you to fast together means you'll stay together. Some of the greatest times we've had in our family is when all of the family would fast together for a revival. It has its effect. I have a 16-year-old daughter who has a bus ministry. And I've watched that young girl, no prompting, she just felt it, fast for three days that God would somehow give her more people on her ministry. And I've watched on Sunday morning as people's walk down that aisle and given their heart to Jesus because she fasted and prayed and they got on her bus and came to God's house and the message of God touched their hearts and they gave their hearts to Jesus. I still believe fasting and prayer will make a difference in anybody's ministry. Would you say amen? <laughs> I know we're living in a... Con not what you're saying is what you're living it's not what you're doing in this and that and the other it's the example you're setting in the home where you live would you say amen <laughs> if they ever do roll my casket down that aisle and park it in front of that pulpit
And if my three girls ever do walk by and look in my face, I may not leave my girls a lot of houses and lands, and I won't leave them a lot of stocks and bonds, but if they can look in my face and say, my daddy was a Christian, a child of the Most High God, that'll be the greatest legacy I could ever leave them. My God, we need more homes that are filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Would you raise up your hands and say amen? Raise your hands and praise the Lord. All over this building, would you raise your hands and praise and magnify His name? Fasting and prayer will not only save our ministry and our families, but fasting and prayer will humble our souls. God, help us to realize there must return to all of our hearts the ability to forgive, the ability to hurt, the ability to prefer our brother. Somehow I think we get caught up in this thing called religion to such a degree until we forget where God brought us from. We forget that we're following the Master and I can see Jesus. He never knew sin. He left everything to walk among men. And as he walked among men, somehow he felt the burden that he knows the church needs to feel. And I could see him as he stood and looked over Jerusalem. And surely the church must be able to look over the world in this hour and sense something of what Jesus sensed. He had walked among them. He had preached to them. He'd healed their sick. And yet they had rejected him. To be rejected does not lessen your responsibility to pray. There is no time to allow our hearts to be filled with hurt and anger and disappointment and bitterness until we fail to seek God for our people. And Jesus cried, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thee thy children together even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings and ye would not Paul cried in Acts chapter 20 and verse 19 I serve the Lord with all humility of mind and with tears God help us to realize the only way these things can happen is through fasting prayer and this day is not going to get it done I believe but through fasting you'll find your soul will be touched afresh through denying yourself and saying to God I'm willing to forego this that I might have that will bring the glories of God to your soul my God friend we can't allow the world to say no to Jesus we can't allow the world to slip through our fingers as it were when we don't put forth an effort would you say amen I'll never forget this, this somehow the time that I found the Lord and I guess the reason I love this church so much I was grown and married 
I had a beautiful girl named Pamela Jo before I ever heard about the Holy Ghost. And I'll never forget on the job where I was working, a man kept on and said, Would you go to church with me? And I didn't have any interest in church. I had been raised a Methodist and a Baptist, didn't go to either one very much. And he belonged to an unusual church. Strange things I had heard took place at that church, and I had no desire to go there. But he just kept on bothering and saying, Would you go with me? And finally I turned to him one day in anger. Roy was a man that knew how to touch God. And he had the tenderest heart. He, he never would take no for an answer. And I turned to him one day and I said, Roy, I'll go with you one time if you'll promise me you'll never ask me again. Get off my back. Don't ever ask me again. I'll go with you one time. And that's all it took to satisfy him. He was as happy as he could be. And I'll never forget the time that I chose to go to church. Of all times to go, I went on a Wednesday night prayer meeting. Didn't bother. Something happened to me. I went by myself. My wife was unsaved. And I was, you know how I felt being a sinner inside of a Pentecostal church. And that preacher got up to preach that night. He preached like a Friday night camp meeting. He preached like the thing was filled up, packed out, and standing on the outside. Just a little handful of people there. And I'll never shall forget it. He gave an altar call like everybody in the whole camp meeting was a sinner. And something reached inside my heart. I don't know what he preached on. But something reached way down inside of me and arrested me. And I staggered down that aisle and knelt in that Pentecostal altar. And I didn't know how to pray. But somehow I just said over and over again, God, help me. And God reached way down that night. And old Roy put his arms around my shoulder. And he wept tears upon my clothing. And he said, God, hear this man's prayer. I want to say to you in this hour, friend, we cannot allow the world to say no but we've got to get a humble heart we've got to get a sob in our hearts we've got to get a tear in our eyes God help us to realize we need to know God is speaking to this world raise your hands and praise and magnify his name Oh. Through prayer and fasting, God will send His healing power. You know, I don't know why we're having difficulty believing God heals. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I am the Lord God that healeth thee. With His stripes we're healed. And if we can't believe that, what can we believe? But I believe we can believe it. And all across this country and all around this world, there has been an outpouring of the miracle working powers of God. And I want to say to you, it's happening in the church. People are being literally divinely healed by the powers of God. Blind eyes are being opened and the cripple are walking. And men are being touched by the miracle healing powers of God in our day, in our generation, and in our church. Would you say amen? And there's no reason if you're here this morning for whatever's bothering you. There's no reason for you to leave sick this morning. But I want to say you're going to have to get out of the boat. You're going to have to get out of the boat. Do you remember the story when Jesus was here upon this earth? He fed the 5,000. It was created such an unusual interest. But then he turned and sent the 5,000 away. And he turned to his disciples and he, the Bible said, constrained them to go across to the other side. Now that word constrained means he literally almost had to make them. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them for to stay around this kind of miracle working power. But the Bible said when they got in that boat, 
and start to cross to the other side. They faced a contrary wind. You'll face it every time. Every time you get ready to do something for God, you're going to face a contrary wind. Every time you get ready to do some great feat for God, you're going to face a contrary wind. Every time God calls you to go somewhere and do a great work, you'll face a contrary wind. Every time you get ready to walk out and get your healing, you'll face a contrary wind. Every time you get ready to believe God for a miracle, you'll face a contrary wind. But it doesn't change the fact He's still the miracle working Jesus that comes the waters. Would you say amen? What? Hallelujah! Now they've been rowing. And instead of the storm subsiding, it's getting worse. And all of a sudden they peer through the darkness and they see someone coming. And it's Jesus. And Jesus bids Peter to come. Peter said, if it's really you, bid me come. And Jesus said the greatest word in the whole New Testament. He said, come. Hallelujah. If he'd have said one more word, old Simon Peter probably made the rapture. But he just simply said, come. Now Peter had to make a decision like you're going to have to make this morning. Peter could stay inside that boat or he could get out and walk the waters. You can have it if you want it. Say amen. You can have it if you want it. You can be healed if you want to be healed. You can feel the touch of God in your life, but you're going to have to get out of the boat. Say amen. Now the Bible doesn't say, but I think Peter had a difficult time making a decision. Remember, doubting Thomas was in the boat. And no doubt Thomas said, man, you're crazy. If you get out of this boat, you'll drown. And old Andrew said, you know, Thomas is right, Peter. You've never walked on water before. You say, brothers, how do you know they said those things? They're still saying it today. You can say, I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith. And somebody will say, don't you do it. You can't make it. I'm going to leave my job and I'm going to trust God. I am going to declare the gospel. And somebody will say, don't you do it. You'll go under. It's the same old thing. I'm going to believe God for my healing. And somebody in well-meaning will say, don't you do it. You know better than to do it. I'm going to let go and let God and somebody will discourage you from doing it. But I want to say this to you. If Jesus bids you come, don't listen to the crowd in the boat. Get out of that boat and walk the waters for Jesus. If God... God, I feel His healing power. Does anybody feel the touch of God? Raise your hand and holler glory. Woo! Hallelujah. What do you need from God? What do you need from God this morning? What kind of miracle do you need from God? What healing do you need? A few days. I am the Lord God that healeth thee. Yea, my pop. Yea, as I healed in days of yester, I will heal in this hour. If you will believe me, I will stretch forth my hand and do a work in your life. Thus saith the Lord. Raise your hand and magnify His name. Oh, oh yes. A few days before leaving for this assembly, a lady called and converse with my wife. Judy Lothridge is only eight years old. Doctors say that she is perhaps the most deformed child that has ever been born and lived. She has been to all the major hospitals in America. Reader's Digest plans to do an article on Judy Lothridge. Her heart was on the wrong side and just so many serious things wrong with her. And Mrs. Lothridge called my wife just a few days ago, crying, and she said, 
Do you know what's happened? We've been praying for Judy's healing. And God has wondrously and gloriously healed her body. She said that she carried little Judy back to Dr. Gray there in Sylacauga. And Dr. Gray examined Judy. And he found that her heart that was on the right side and had always been irregular by some curious, miraculous means has been moved to its correct position and it's beating normally. Dr. Gray, when he examined that child, was so overcome, he grabbed her in his arm and broke down and wept like a baby. I said that to say to you, if God can heal an eight-year-old Judy Lothridge, God can heal you in this assembly. If God can reach down and take perhaps the most seriously deformed child and work a miracle in her life, don't you know that God could divinely heal you this very day? Stand to your feet and raise your hands and praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Oh, let everything that hath breath praise Him. My God, I feel a wind blowing. A wind of healing. A wind of healing. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Hallelujah. Oh, oh, ha. my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, great God, he's here. Oh, God. Now listen to me just for a moment. God loves you. Oh, I don't care what your difficulties are this morning. God loves you. It is the will of God that you be healed in this service this morning. There's no way that we can form a healing line. I just feel constrained of God to tell you. God, oh my Lord, yes, God wants to breathe His healing breath upon this congregation.